Firstly, a few webinar protocols. Our guest will present for roughly 45 minutes. Any questions that participants may have, we request you please to use the Q&A Q &A button to send through these questions, which will be addressed after the presentation. Today, we are delighted to welcome our guest, Dion Chang, whose webinar theme is The Great Staggering. Dion Chang is a strategic thinker, one of South Africa's most respected trend analysts and founder of Flux Trends which takes the unique view of trends as business strategy. Dion is passionate about assisting companies embrace change and embedding a culture of innovation into corporate operating systems. His 20 year experience in the media industry as a journalist and media spokesperson enables him to provide insights into the ever changing relationship between brands, consumers and the communication channels that bind them. He has a deep passion for youth trends and subcultures, as well as for solution-based innovation for greater good. Without any further ado, the virtual stage is all yours, Dion. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Anna. And a very, very good morning to everybody. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen uh, while I do that. Um, the great staggering, well, there's a lot of unexpected um, things that are around. Just uh, hold on, this is not giving me exactly what I wanted to do. Um, there we go. Um, just to start again, um, the, there is a lot of uncertainty, um, and I just think with the constitutional uh, ruling today about uh, what happens with um, uh, everything that we've got with the uh, the lockdown and that it has been um, deemed unconstitutional, I think everyone's going to be very, very confused. Um, just a quick one, you might be confused because for some strange reason, uh, Zoom has called me Layla, um, so I'm not Layla, this is Dion, um, but I welcome you all to this uh, trend briefing. Um, as Anna said, uh, so firstly, thank you, Anna, and also to, to Hazel for inviting me to, to address you all this morning. Um, the Great Staggering is what I'm calling the interim period from uh, when the pandemic hit to when we are eventually going to get some sort of a vaccine, uh, which is probably going to be till um, next year. So what I want to do today is, um, as you see on screen, it's called Making a Plan uh, for Life in Limbo. Um, but I'm concentrating also on innovation because I think this is a, a perfect time and a crucial time to really, really innovate. So I'm going to be uh, going through some of the uh, findings from a report that we've got called Life After COVID. Um, you'll see it's called part one because uh, I think the things are changing so, so, so fast. Um, and what I will do is look at uh, what happened before the pandemic struck because I think while we are already in June, the first six months of 2020, kind of got side, side, uh, sidewinded and sidestepped uh, because of the pandemic. Um, I think there are a lot of trends that were affecting businesses just before we went into the pandemic, which we mustn't forget about. So I want to start with where we left 2019 off. And this is a very, very telling picture. So um, we have a presentation every year called The State We're In, and it looks uh, at the world within six trend pillars, whether it's politics, whether it's uh, eco, um, the, the sort of sustainability or eco trends, uh, to pop culture trends, to technology. And we called this, this year's presentation, um, the, the politics of rage and polarization. And as you see on screen, um, is a picture of Hong Kong in 2019. And we now uh, are moving into a very, very turbulent time in America, but as well as back into Hong Kong. But I want to just point out that in 2019, um, they said a quarter of the world's countries, that's 47 countries around the world, um, all experienced a surge in political or uh, civil protests. Um, and there were two triggers that really marked these protests around the world. And they were very, very small things. And that is an important one to just keep in, 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 in mind for the rest of this year. So the first predictor was really a weakening of um, mechanisms to, to express discontent. So whether it was on press freedom or on labor unions, um, that was a really uh, 
small trigger or quite a large trigger to do that. The smaller ones were very, very interesting. So for example, um, in Chile, a 4% rise of subway fares brought thousands of people out on the street. The same thing happened in Lebanon. Um, a 20 cent tax uh, on using WhatsApp brought complete protests out there. So this happened, uh, these protests happened um, in uh, Iraq, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Haiti, in Spain. Um, just the world seemed to be erupting. And now we're seeing that the world is um, probably erupting in a very, very different uh, way as well. Um, we're all following what is happening um, in America, and uh, it's been uh, a nerve that has been hit. So we've gone from a very, very volatile 2019, um, and then with the fear of the pandemic um, and lockdowns and, and just people's lives being changed, um, the sparking, uh, uh, the killing of, of George Floyd has just sparked things um, around the world. And you'll see um, even in Syria, in war-torn Syria, in amongst the rubble, um, this message has uh, been taken um, through to every part of the world. There's this protest happening around the world. But in January and in February, uh, the world was put on pause. And, um, and that's why I'm saying we are now, um, countries around the world from uh, Monday have started easing lockdown. And what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for, for businesses? Essentially, it means that we need to do multiple multiple steps or staggered uh, a series of staggered st strategies for our business because it's not going to be something that is long term. We're going to have to do something short term, something medium term, something medium and long term, and then possibly a long term one which will probably change as well. But humans are, excuse me, humans are very very adaptable, um, and we've seen specifically. Um, the streaming, so you're all joining me here uh, completely remotely. Uh, we are able to stream. Um, I wrote a column I write for City Press um, on Sunday, and I said uh, what's happening at the moment is there's lots of technologies which enable us to carry on with life, but because it's possible doesn't mean it's preferable because we're starting to, to understand screen fatigue, lockdowns, what that does to, to human nature. Um, so on the screen, you'll see a streamed funeral, but we're also mourning our, our freedoms, our civil freedoms of, of how we can move around and, and what's, what's happened. And uh, yesterday's ruling with the Constitutional Court about uh, the levels uh, of, of lockdown being unconstitutional bring us kind of full circle again. We're going to have to rethink all of that, or the government's going to have to rethink all of that. Um, but we're a very resourceful species, and uh, here's just something on a lighter note. This is a, a priest uh, from St. Ambrose Parish in, in, in America um, dispensing holy water with a, with a, uh, a, a water pistol um, and doing social distancing uh, with that. So we've been able to carry on with, with life. But one of the good things that we need to remember is that there are certain behaviors that, that are going to resonate during this time, during the lockdown period, which are going to continue. So this is going to alter a lot of business, uh, business models. Um, one of the things that I keep saying to, to, to a lot of businesses that we, we consult with is don't forget that um, the, the, the societal change that we experienced in the first six months of this year are going to be long standing. Um, so while everybody is, is understandably trying to get the, the economy back uh, and resuscitate it and get all of your businesses, specifically if you run a small business, um, up and running again, we mustn't forget that during lockdown, everyone has had their own little or large existential crisis at home. So it's not so much about rejigging your business or resuscitating your business, but how does your business now fit into a changed social mindset? And that's the really important thing. So on Monday, um, some people might have gone back to, to an office, and this is where the great staggering is. So this is the first part of, of very immediate things that you need to start thinking about as a business owner or if you are just going into the work, uh, into the work uh, area. Um, if you'll see here on the screen, um, it's from a real estate company called uh, Cushman and Wakefield. They've been helping um, companies in China, about 10,000 of those companies, get people back to work. So they have a good track record of what works and what doesn't work. And here's some of their tips. So uh, you'll see on the screen, 
um, a lot of the desks uh, have uh, these circles drawn around them or big carp, circular carpets put down on the floor. Um, these are just to visual reminders for people not to, to come close and to keep physical distancing in, in place. You'll also see that, uh, or maybe you might not, it's a small picture, um, on each of the desks is a sheet of paper. Um, so once you enter the, the office environment, you take the sheet of paper, you put it down on your work uh, station, and that uh, is discarded at the end of the day um, to stop the, the contact, uh, the possible contact of, of any um, uh, virus that might have uh, been left on a, on a surface. One of the more um, interesting uh, notions, um, well, there's two actually. The one is saying that in a work environment or in an office environment, um, you do what the hospitals do. And so everybody is required to, to walk either clockwise or anti-clockwise within that workspace and only that clockwise or anti-clockwise. They do this in hospitals to prevent people sort of crisscrossing each other and passing on uh, more possible infections uh, to do that. Um, the, the, the very interesting concept that I've, I've heard of, um, because we're going to be staggered, and I don't think any company, or it won't be wise for any company to say, all right, the entire workforce, if you've got 500 people, 1,000 people, 2,000 people in a workforce, to all come back and start a nine to five um, type kind of uh, work, uh, work hours. What you're going to see is, or you should be seeing, are shifts. So um, some people should come in half days, uh, that start at nine, some maybe come in at 11, some come in uh, after lunch, um, but everybody should start getting used to working on shifts. And the most sensible one concept I've seen is a four days on, 10 days off concept, meaning you work in an office environment for four days and then you work remotely for 10 days. This means that if you have uh, caught the virus from somebody who's asymptomatic during those four days, you are in essence, self-isolating for the 10 days afterwards. Um, and that, that allows uh, symptoms to, to uh, manifest and you can be isolated if that happens. We had a very uh, uh, interesting question that came through um, uh, yesterday from, uh, from one of the people that are, the delegates are signed in. Um, and it says, here, I'll just read the question to you. It says, with lockdown easing, most people might have gone or gone back to the office environment. Um, and with this, office waste is likely to increase, and this includes uh, things like tissues, where the people blow their noses. So the question is, um, is will we need to handle waste very, very differently? And uh, if it goes into land sites and all of those kind of things, tissues specifically, I mean, we talked about the, I talked about these uh, sort of placemats that you put onto a desk, but that should be treated the same way. Um, as, as those tissues or those tissues need to be completely separated into that. So, um, so the, the, the short answer is yes. The practical answer of how one does that is exactly what we need to start thinking about in the Great Staggering because there are a lot of things that are being, being thrown at companies which they're not used to doing. So there, there's, a, there's a, a, a divide between which businesses will either survive online or otherwise um, still keep the hybrid model of some things online and some things offline. So on the screen, you'll see uh, the exercise business like uh, yoga classes or things like that. Um, not really your, your gyms and free weights, but, uh, but classes um, are being proven to be able to be done remotely. And that's probably going to stay remain as a hybrid model. Um, on the screen is restaurants. I think almost every single restaurant is trying to salvage their business and by doing so, just doing takeaways. But not all restaurants are geared up for that and it's not a perfect business model to do that, which is why it is an interim stopgap. So hence, a short, a very, very short-term immediate uh, business strategy, a slightly longer short-term, again, a strategy, a medium-term strategy, and then looking back into the future. Um, there are obviously some companies and some sectors that are, are doing really, really well. Um, our habits in terms of e-commerce and online shopping are going to remain. I think a lot of the companies that are offering those services have had to up their games very, very fast um, and, and to create that capacity to, in order to, 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 to help those deliveries. But I've seen a lot of collaborations, and I think this is very, very crucial within the great staggering, is that you think about how um, delivery services, e-hailing services, all of those kind of things can create a smaller scale of an e-commerce model 
um, for your business. Um, and I think those things are, are, are really worth exploring because I think there's going to be a lot of collaboration needed to get us through the next six months um, of this year. One of the things, uh, what you're seeing on screen is just proposed ways and means of getting into, say, a large supermarket, say, a large hypermarket or even shopping centers. Um, and already a lot of innovation is coming through. Um, uh, there's a South African company, the data analytics company Lightstone, and they've launched a tracker called uh, ShopSafe app, which basically looks at, at all of the shopping centers uh, in your area, and they will uh, tell you um, how full the shopping centers are, if it's, it's a bit of a quiet time, it's better to go now. These are all things that you're going to need to factor into it. So um, the reason why I've called on the slide the, the, the importance of UX, so user experience or CX, customer experience, is going to be crucial within the next couple of months, is to really work out, um, and that goes for that question about waste as well, is how do we manage all of these things? And there's a whole lot of things on the periphery which um, you, you would not have had to, to consider in a normal business environment, which you now have to. Um, but there is going to be, unfortunately, a lot more collateral damage because, like I said, with restaurants, um, simply doing a delivery service is not really going to help um, some of those restaurants uh, stay afloat in the long term. It will just help keep uh, some um, of the, the, the cash flow going so that when you can eventually open up, you'll be able to do that. But we're already seeing in the South African context that uh, in the last couple of months, um, really devastating news. So Edcon already was uh, starting to, to falter last year. Um, they've gone into you know, business rescue, associated magazines or associated media publishing. The Rafaeli magazine empire um, eventually had to close last month. Um, and we're still trying to resuscitate South African airways. And um, while I'm a patriotic South African, I'm not sure that's really going to happen. Um, but if we take the EdCon example, for example, uh, as an example, one of the things that is interesting with what we do at Flux Trends is um, we jokingly say to, to ourselves in the office that we feel a bit like the canaries in a mine shaft. We know uh, from which sectors or which companies are really in stress or experiencing huge disruption because those are the clients that we have. So year on year, the, the profile of the client starts changing, although financial services has been a standard. So financial services has been in, in almost constant disruption. But we understand and we know which sectors are, are, are very, very uh, distressed. Um, so, for example, in 2017, uh, there was a huge uh, retail meltdown. There were you know, phrases like retail Armageddon and Morgan and, and all of these kind of things. Um, so we were talking in 2017 with your retailing uh, companies, your Mr. Prices, uh, possibly a Visa, MasterCard, uh, uh, retailers within malls and the, the mall management. Um, 2018 uh, kind of settled down. And then it was interesting last year, we had a lot of queries from asset management companies. So these are the property developers um, or the landlords of the malls and they were starting to scratch their head because the ripple effect of what was happening in retail started reaching them and uh, we were asked to say, you know, um, are we building too many car parks? Is transient ownership going to become something that, that we need to consider in South Africa? All of these things. And the reason why I paused on this slide is because if EdCon does completely falter and fold, uh, which we hope it doesn't, that means um, a huge knock-on effect, not only for the job loss, so 14,000 permanent uh, employees, 25,000 temporary staff, and 800 suppliers who are really not being paid uh, from the likes of Edgar's, but in terms of more management, in terms of asset management, in terms of property management, um, Edcon's floor space amounts for one-tenth of the occupancy in South African shopping malls. If Edcon disappears, that's going to leave a huge vacuum uh, within the retail sector, and that's going to uh, then have a ripple effect on, on asset management, on, on developments, on, on a whole lot of things that we are seeing. But one of the things that they are calling this pandemic, uh, well, there's two things. Uh, one is the pandemic of hate, and one is the pandemic of inequality. The pandemic of hate, because of the rising xenophobia that's been around the world, and as a third generation South African uh, with Chinese descent, I feel that xenophobia uh, in a very, very real sense. It's been a very, very real and distressing 
period for me um, just to be Asian uh, and to be blamed for, for this virus. But the other one that has really uh, been, been highlighted um, is the inequalities. So when the virus first started to, uh, to come into South Africa, um, and this is sort of true of, of most uh, emerging markets or developing countries, it's been called the disease of the rich. And it's been called the disease, disease of the rich because um, it is spread by people who have the means to travel. Um, and also, if you have good health care or health insurance, you have much more of a chance of survival. And around the world, we've seen the demographics of, uh, of this play out. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, the minorities and lower income groups that are going to suffer the most. And we are bracing ourselves for a winter in South Africa to find out what is going to be that impact um, in dense areas uh, within townships, within informal settlements, um, and all of that going through there. So um, I'm hoping that um, after 9-11, we saw an increase of funding in national security. We, as uh, travelers, uh, also gave up a lot of our freedoms to go through very lengthy um, checks at uh, airport securities. And I'm hoping that um, once the pandemic is finished, we will start relooking essential workers and pay people like teachers and nurses um, a much, much higher and much more appreciative salary than we do now, and that we are going to get um, equitable health care uh, for all. But in terms of property, going back to property again, um, people are starting to, to ask, is there going to be an urban exodus? If there are so many smaller businesses that are closing, uh, we might start seeing over the next six months, um, if uh, the smaller businesses don't survive, uh, the loss of mom and pop type shops and this, the, the survival only of big global franchises. Um, and that will mean a very, very bland retail uh, environment. Um, and as uh, it'll be much less competitive um, and much less individualistic. Um, so we're going to start feeling everything is very, very similar. But even before the pandemic started, there was an exodus to what people are referring to as second tier cities. Um, cities where accommodation is a lot uh, more affordable um, and possibly where the, the job opportunities um, are, are, are a little bit better. Um, in America, they've been calling young millennials, uh, well, not so young for the oldest ones now, but the new urban poor, because uh, these are people who are still paying off, they're caught between the trap of paying off their student loans, um, as well as not getting the employment that the degrees that they thought they were the, the, the degrees they were studying for would get them the jobs those jobs aren't coming so they're caught between a rock and a hard place and this has started the migration to these second tier cities so will the pandemic uh, accelerate this as well that's my question but i want to go through just quickly what was on the radar before the pandemic struck and these we're going to start seeing through the great staggering these these issues are gonna come back onto the radar. I'm gonna go back to retail because that's just a huge sector that, that's suffered during the pandemic. But if you see on this, uh, the screen, um, this is already from our 2017 research that we were already finding then that there was a perfect storm that was brewing for, for retailers. Um, so I'm just not sure on the, if it's from your right to left or left to right, but from uh, my, my left, the snail, a sluggish economy. Well, our economies around the globe have been decimated by the pandemic, so um, it's not going to be a slow economy, but just uh, an economy that needs to be revived as soon as possible. The second picture there uh, represents uh, the sharing economy, and uh, we are starting to find out really quickly, um, you know, anybody who's taken a, an Uber ride or has booked an Airbnb, you have joined that sharing economy. But it's becoming a lot more prevalent, specifically with a younger millennial and a Gen Z demographic. And I'll get to the Gen Zs a little bit later, but we are starting to understand that we don't really need to own something to be able to experience it or to use the service. Um, so around the world, we're also uh, hearing in complexes or in, in residential buildings, um, there is a shared uh, hardware uh, store or a, a, a workshop stash. So if you're in that community or if you're in that building, if you need a drill, if you need a vacuum cleaner, if you need this, it is shared appliances so that everybody doesn't have to buy their own um, and the usage is, is much more uh, of a better return of investment. 
Um, the third picture is online shopping. And I mentioned that I think uh, what's happening in South Africa, it was a small part of the retail pie, but we are during lockdown getting more and more um, uh, ready to, to, to do these online purchases. Um, I know there's going to be a question of, well, these are, you know, we, we live in a divided economy, so how does that play out? And, and we can answer that question after that. Um, but the last one is just brand homogeny. We are starting to see um, the same things happening. I've got a lot of friends um, who are in sort of global retail and everybody through the pandemic and before the pandemic is saying this has to stop um, because what we've started to see with fast fashion and global supply chains, um, this was one of the hugest risks uh, during the pandemic and people are now starting to question the cycles of fast fashion, big major uh, brands in, internationally, Gucci being one of them, has decided they're not, they're bailing out of the fashion week cycle. Instead of doing five collections a year, they're going to do two collections. So sustainability is really coming through uh, very, very strongly. Um, with our asset managers, we also discussed how to repurpose more space. Uh, this was pre-pandemic, but I think uh, post-pandemic is going to be even more uh, of, an, of an issue if, uh, uh, if businesses don't survive. Um, so what do we do with those? Uh, from green spaces to co-working spaces to specifically creating after-school hubs so that people, uh, communities who don't have access to internet are able to come to a central place that has good transport hubs, that has good spacing to be, to, to be able to do uh, you know, uh, uh, after school and homework kind of uh, environments. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities we can explore with that as well. Going back to transient economy uh, or transient uh, ownership, uh, this is another one. It's not an e-hailing uh, system. This is owned by BMW um, and Mini Cooper in, internationally. It's very, very big in Europe. Uh, this is just a different kind of uh, sharing system where uh, you look for a car on your app, it identifies one where it's parked, uh, you open it with a pin code, you drive it off, you park it wherever you need to go, and somebody picks it up um, after that. People will always say to me, well, that's never going to happen in South Africa. Um, it actually did in 2015, um, except we have very, very, uh, uh, let's say, um, ingenious South Africans uh, because the the rate for having a car over the weekend was something like 40, 48 cents uh, an hour uh, for a 48 hour period. Um, so instead of people leaving the cars um, on the pavements, they would park it in the basement parking of their complex so that nobody else could get that. Um, so that company has now sold that business uh, to Bidvest. So we'll be interested to see how that comes in. So never assume that what I'm showing you is just first world or international case studies. Um, they do happen here. And I just want to show you a trajectory of what transient ownership can do. So this is what you're seeing is in Paris. Um, in the 70s, they created huge housing estates um, uh, on the periphery of Paris. And uh, with that, they built uh, enormous underground parking lots. So last year, uh, this was on the BBC, um, they discovered that those parking lots are now completely deserted and empty. Nobody is parking them because car ownership um, has decreased so much. There's so much, uh, there's sort of electric car sharing, there's the systems that I showed you drive now, there's e-hailing, all of those kind of things. Um, but this is a ripple effect of transient ownership. So a young company called Cycloponics uh, won a bid to start growing mushrooms uh, in these dank, moist conditions underground, and they also uh, farm chicory and, underneath there. This has a win-win situation because the restaurants that buy the produce from uh, Cycloponics um, can very proudly say to their patrons, uh, the mushrooms that you are eating have literally come from under, under your feet um, and there's no carbon footprint with that. But on that note of climate change, um, don't underestimate where we left 2019 off. Uh, so they, these three sectors on the screen um, are the sectors that they said are in the crosshairs um, and in the firing line for climate change. And these are the sectors that are going to be most uh, requested to reduce carbon footprints and, and carbon emissions. So it was oil and gas firms, uh, the airlines and car makers, and we've seen through the pandemic because of lockdown, 
these sectors really, really suffer. We're not sure if they're going to really bounce back. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then meat producers as well, because there's this huge shift to, to plant-based diets. So in terms of consumer mindset, we are changing very, very quickly. And our awareness of sustainability is very, very strong. So if you are one of those companies that produce things for, for home usage, home care production, uh, productions, uh, this started at the beginning of 2019, a concept called Loop, uh, a very brave concept. They had to go around to the big um, home care producers, your record big users, your Unilevers, Procter & Gamble's, um, to say, join us in this crusade <coughs> excuse me, of creating a circular economy so we reduce the amount of single-use plastics in, our, uh, in the world. Um, so you'll see a whole lot of brands uh, within one year, 150 brands uh, were joined uh, by Loop, and it's an on-demand um, subscription model, which is very, very clever as well. So uh, you'll see Ariel uh, soap powder there, uh, you order all of these products, they bring it to you, they deliver. Uh, once you've finished, you don't throw away the containers, you just phone Loop again and they will replenish whatever uh, you need. It's become so successful that um, they said uh, this year, well, it's been a bit of a staggering, but this year some of these Loop products will be, um, have, have migrated onto retail into bricks and mortar. So you'll be able to actually buy these um, part of the Loop circular system, system and then put it back into a circular economy once you're at home and once you've used that. So something that's really happening that's very interesting, um, I'm sure everybody's heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, this is just where um, human uh, waste in terms of plastic gets caught in the Pacific Ocean and uh, because of the currents, it just churns and churns and churns and this is kilometers uh, long of just waste plastic. So they've started to harvest that plastic um, and we're gonna start seeing uh, products uh, by, they said, by September 2020, um, of products that have been harvested from the ocean. One of the leaders uh, in terms of circular economies and circular products is Adidas. Um, you will start seeing two new labels uh, in terms of footwear by Adidas. One is called Prime Blue, one is called Prime Green. The Prime Blue products are all um, recycled plastics harvest from, harvested from the ocean and Prime Green are polyester or PET bottles uh, that have been recycled on land. So for me, the new uh, luxury uh, status symbol is not going to be a big fashion brand, but whether you are wearing prime blue or prime green or something that is harvested from the ocean. And just a final note on sustainability. It was interesting at the end of last year that um, sustainability loans were starting to be issued to different companies. So sustainability loans were, were quite common or understood in say mining or, or those kind of sectors or manufacturing. But this was the first time a luxury brand like Prada got a 50 million euro loan from the Credit Agricole Group in France, but it had conditions. And the conditions were all linked to sustainability. So they said, if all of your stores become LEED compliant, we will reduce the interest rates. If all of your staff are trained within sustainability issues and understand that, we will start reducing that. So the same thing now is happening with bailouts uh, because of the pandemic. So Air France, being an example in, in, in France, they've been given a bailout, but the conditions were you have to reduce your carbon emissions by X, Y, Z, within the next five years. And in Denmark, these kind of sustainability bailouts are starting to do that. So a very interesting time in terms of sustainability that is going to come onto the radar once we uh, go back to some kind of normality, but now is really the time to rethink. And this is what uh, we do at Flux with a lot of executives in different companies. We have closed door sessions and we call them pre-strategy pre-strategy sessions, because the question we ask, and this is what I want to ask everybody in the audience now, we can answer this afterwards, I won't take questions now, I've got a second uh, part of this, is in your own businesses, just think of what the key disruptors are. They could be something that's very immediate, for example, that question about uh, waste or, or tissues at offices, how do you dispose of that? What are the key disruptors? Or what are the blind spots that you might not have been considering 
that are kind of global trends that are happening uh, with, with that. Um, so the, what I want to do now, is, while you think about that, is just starting to change um, the thought process a little bit. Because if we looked at all that's necessary within uh, the, the Great Staggering, how are you going to have to do a short-term, uh, uh, a new strategy for that, uh, something that is a little bit medium-term, and then a longer term one, and then possibly that's all going to change when we go into 2021, uh, when we finally get in. How does this all impact your business? Um, well, innovation is the key. So I think a lot of things that people thought about innovation was it was a nice to have, and it might possibly you know come in useful. It's not crucial to my business now, but I hope that I've illustrated that it is really crucial to start in and really thinking about new and very, very agile and very short-term business strategies to do that. When you are looking at a long-term innovation process, um, I do a lot of work uh, with, with some other business colleges as well and with, with big corporates about innovation. It's one of my passions. I went on an innovation tour of um, the top performing companies in Manhattan about four years ago um, to find out what the, the, the holy grail of innovation was. And I came back with a 180 degree complete polar opposite uh, vision of why companies also can't scale it. Uh, I, I went to an, an innovation masterclass in Silicon Valley about how to scale innovation in large corporates because that seemed to be the stumbling block. And the findings, if I really boil it down to two things, is structure and also um, not having it outsourced. When I speak to large companies, um, I always say to them, you know, do you outsource your innovation? And they say, yes, very proudly. We have an innovation hub. Um, and I say, but do you realize that innovation hubs are actually sometimes very counterproductive? And people look at me with really, really strange sort of dead silence. Um, and I say, you know, let me explain. And I spoke to a lot of people in innovation hubs is when the innovation process is not pervasive throughout the company culture. Um, and if it's delegated to a innovation hub, what happens is that the management or the leadership or the rest of the company fold their arms, sit back and say, well, you provide that uh, silver bullet that's going to just uh, create a, you know, a new business model and we'll wait for you to do it. Um, if, you, if I take some of the things that I spoke to people in, in corporate business innovation hubs, they said it wasn't a shortage of ideas that they had. Um, one innovation hub, I think it was at IBM, had about 14 projects that they were still trying to implement, but they couldn't implement that. And what happens is you go one step forward, two steps back, and the innovation hubs get very demoralized because you have to have a champion that's championing that with our funding. You have to have buy-in from the entire organization and specifically leadership. And a lot of the times it's not there. So on screen is just one of the ways in which things are structured um, within different companies and large companies. Um, and you'll just see there that the, the different mindsets you need to, to create that innovation process. Um, and there are key things that need to be, to be put in place within your company, whether it's psychological safety so that everybody feels that we can take this risk or there's dependability, that everybody depends on each other to, to, to complete their tasks. Um, structure and clarity, uh, very much like what's on screen, is we need different thinkers, we need design and entrepreneur uh, to make all of this happen. And then impact and meaning, especially in a post-COVID environment, we want a lot more meaning and a lot more impact. It can't just be for bottom line or shareholder primacy. People are wanting a little bit something more from people, brand values out of a brand. So I want to talk a little bit about skills and you'll be wondering why I've put a picture of a casino and uh, the landing page of a smartphone um, on the screen. Um, and this is what I'm telling, and I hope there's a lot of parents out there of Generation Z, your teenagers, because I speak to a lot of you guys. Um, a lot of parents say, what must my child study? They're about to get into matric or, um, and we don't really know. My answer to them is that whatever you are embarking on, um, in this day and age means that you will not only change lanes into a different company, but into a completely different sector. So the reason why I've got a casino slot machine on the screen is that um, a while back, the biggest poaching that was happening in Silicon Valley 
for app developers, for software developers, for operation, uh, software operation um, systems uh, was actually poaching slot machine casino designers to come and design those apps. And the reason why I put those two pictures there is you will see the similarity between that. On your smartphone, the haptic effects, the different lights, the, the colored blinking lights, the sounds, all of those things, it is the Silicon Valley business model of eyeball time. We know now, or I hope you know now, that if you have children, and I think we need to, as adults, also admit that we have an addiction to cell phones as well, but that addiction has been very, very cleverly engineered. And now you know why, is because they've been using casino designers to actually design your apps and the interface of your cell phone to keep you on the phone as much as possible. So if I take it into skills, don't underestimate where the new ideas will come from. And here I want to talk about diversity and inclusivity. In South Africa, we look at diversity and inclusivity purely based on race and gender and possibly a little bit of um, um, uh, uh, identity politics. Um, but it's proven uh, throughout businesses that the more you have a diverse workforce, the more you have better ideas. And especially if you are part of any financial services, especially if you're in banking, you will know that the banks understand that the biggest threat to banking is not from the banking business, but it is going to come from outside, probably a social media company, which they've already started, to create financial services for a younger audience. Um, and that is what's going to take your market share out there. So expertise and knowledge outside of an industry is sometimes a lot more helpful. And I'm gonna give you a case study about seeing things with the eyes of a child and how diversity actually starts affecting your innovation process. Um, I went to a diversity and in innovation uh, conference, a huge one in New York uh, 2018. Um, and I came back with that with a lot of insights about how we do it in South Africa. And I think in South Africa, we've ticked diversity boxes, but we haven't really, really addressed inclusivity. So if diversity is who's in the room, inclusivity is what each of those persons, those people do and what their positions are. And we haven't really cracked that. But I want to just show, share a case study um, of a hospital. Um, uh, it was in New York where they were trying, what every business is trying to do is improve business efficiency. So they did the usual things. They interviewed all of the doctors at the hospital, they interviewed the nurses, they interviewed the administ administrative staff. And at the end, they said the best insights they got after a couple of month long process was actually from the security guard who stood at emergency and watched people come and go day in and day out. Not the doctors, not the nurses, and not the administrative staff, but a completely unrelated person, the security guard at emergency um, uh, at, the, at the emergency ward, uh, to see what the problems uh, and the UX and the, uh, the customer experience was. So your good ideas might come from anywhere. And uh, my question to you is: in your organisation, in your business, do you have a speak up culture? And I specifically ask not only of uh, the, the current workforce but of a younger workforce. Do you ever listen to what their ideas are? Because what I get over and over again, specifically from executives is, well, they don't know the business. They don't understand the business. Yes, granted. But if we're talking about a new workforce, specifically Gen Z, these are digital natives. We are living in a digital era. Is it not worth your two minutes to listen to just one or two ideas which might actually transform your business? Because if you think about it, um, innovation is challenging the status quo. So if you do not allow people to challenge the status quo within your business, you are giving, doing yourself a huge disservice. And here's an example, not so much what's on screen, but another case study, uh, this time from Amazon. So Amazon is not the perfect uh, case study to use, but I like what they do in terms of how they approach failure. So failure, if you are embarking on a new project, should not be about what went wrong, but rather what to remind you what matters most about your business and what you were trying to improve in your business in order to push it forward. 
So in Amazon, um, a lot of their teams have fitness tests. If one of the teams fails a fitness test, this is interesting. What they do is that they disband the team, but the management that oversees those, uh, that, that group, that team, they then go away and they discuss how the management team failed the, the other team that are below them. So it flips management and it flips hierarchies completely on their heads because they say, how did we fail them? How did this not, why were they not supported enough? Why did we not give them an enabling environment for this thing to flourish? And I think that's an important one to do so. So I'm going to just end off here um, on a future trajectory. We've looked at the great staggering, what's happened, uh, kind of what we need to do right now within the next six months at least. Uh, we looked at trends that uh, were um, on the radar beforehand that are going to come back onto the radar uh, uh, once we are a little bit more established and find our feet again. And then I want to look a little bit more into the future. So, um, sorry, you've got the certs from uh, NetBank because I've just done something with NetBank with this. But I want to talk about Africa and I want to talk about Generation Z. So if you look at the map on the screen here, you will see Africa stands out really radically in terms of age demographics. We are a very, very young continent. So people have thought that Africa is a millennial continent. It is actually a Gen Z continent. So for people who are confused about Gen Z and millennials, your oldest Gen Zs are 22, maybe 23. Um, and the youngest ones are just coming into puberty, uh, 12, 13 years old or so. So the median age in Africa is 18, which means that by mid-century, uh, we are going to have a population explosion, which uh, makes a lot of sense. So if the um, majority of the continent is at 18 now, within the next 20 to 30 years, um, it means that uh, we will have this uh, population explosion. Um, all of these Gen Zs are going to go to work. They're all going to uh, settle down. They're going to procreate, have their own children. Um, but by mid-century, 35% of the world's youth will be concentrated in Africa. We are a very, very young continent, and the opportunities within that are really, really good. So I want to just go on to Gen Z and we are seeing over and over again, there was just uh, uh, on the screen, you'll see a progression of Time Magazine covers uh, from 2013 up to last year with Greta Thunberg. Um, but we are starting to see that this is a very, very different generation. Um, the first digital natives in, in mankind's history, uh, we, they have a very, very different way of uh, absorbing information, um, of, of stimulus in terms of that. Um, and we completely disregard that kind of stimulus and, and the way of learning. So don't get me started on sort of schooling systems that were spawned in the mid 19th century and how we kind of look at schools and education compared to what businesses are needing now and also in the future. So we did a, a survey and these were some of the findings. We released this Gen Z report or this presentation uh, last week. We will be releasing a big Gen Z report um, on Youth Day on June the 16th this year. But I want to just give you a snippet of what is in the minds of our young people. And remember, these are not only your next generation customers. So if they're coming of age and starting to work, they now earn money. But I always say to, to a lot of parents of teenagers, uh, you know very well who manipulates the family budget, uh, who decides where you go on holiday, what you eat, what tech you buy, and now that these, uh, this generation is coming of age, um, it means that they have the spending power and they are also your entry-level workforce. So listen to this. 66% of them want to own their own businesses. There's a very strong entrepreneurial uh, streak in them. 72% um, that believe, if you are a brand in a business, that businesses need to have values and be philanthropic. Um, and here's one that's a bit of an ouch to an older generation. 62% believe that older, the older generation have created the world's problems that we're dealing with now. In terms of work, remember this is a hybrid, uh, multi-skilled uh, multi kind of generation. Uh, if you have a teenager, you'll know that they're probably on three devices while they're watching TV. Actually, they probably weren't even watching TV, uh, streaming Netflix and chatting to their friends uh, there. But, <coughs> excuse me, one of the most important things is 
for a Gen Z, work is not a place you go to, which is much more of an older generation uh, concept of work, but what you do and the passion. Just excuse me. <coughs> so these, this is one of the um, slides I show to a lot of companies. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, this is the lie that we've all been to told which will lead to eternal happiness. So you go to school, you go to varsity, you work maybe for one or two companies, and then you retire and then you die. Nice linear way of looking at things. Um, in fact, this is really what's happening. Um, a lot of um, further education, many retirements, uh, all of that. So especially if you're looking at a younger generation, but I think we need to take this in ourselves, we need to understand the concept of a career portfolio rather than a career trajectory. And with that, I want to end with continual learning. Um, I'm not sure what the average age of everybody watching, but I'm way over this, I say this uh, comfortably, is that your skills become obsolete at the age of 40 in a digital environment. So you have to upskill. So I want to end off in terms of leadership. Uh, what I do a lot with is learning zones. And instead of being the CFO or the CEO, we should all become the CLO, which is the chief learning officer. Um, and in terms of learning zones, uh, professional athletes spend 95% of their time training, a learning zone, and 2-3% of the time performing, which is in a performance zone. We spend 95% of our time in a performance zone and only that small percentage in a learning zone, and that has to change very, very quickly. And with that, thank you very, very much. I know I've gone slightly over the time, but... Uh, we can take, I'll stop sharing and we can start taking some questions um, if you have. Great. Thank you very much, Dion, for these most insightful and inspiring presentation thoughts that you've shared. Indeed, we will need to shift our current mindsets to adapt to this uh, post COVID-19 era. Um, you've also shared wonderful, insightful, uh, innovative approaches, techniques, strategies that we as individuals and of course businesses need to embrace when navigating the new normal. So um, without any further ado from my side, we do have um, three questions from the, the participants. Um, so if we take the first one, Yes, okay, I've got that on my screen as well. <clears throat> Lindiwe, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, transit ownership, um, yes. So if I look at emerging markets around the world, so, so obviously I get this question a lot about, so what happens in South Africa because we have this dual economy and I'm very cognizant of that because <clears throat> what we do at Flux is we, we scour global best case studies and then we bring it back. And then especially for our clients, we say, depending on what your sector is and, and who you're speaking to, we skew those trends towards the South African context. So the one interesting thing that's happened um, in China, um, and you're starting to see this happen in, in Russia, so, so part of the BRICS uh, group of countries, is that the, if you see an emerging middle class, uh, especially coming um, into, into that middle class environment, um, you get asset building, which is uh, sometimes it, it translates into conspicuous consumption and people want to buy a lot of things which they didn't have previously. So your question is very, very valid. What we've seen internationally with the same emerging middle classes is a, a quickening of the cycle. So if you look at developed world countries, it took almost two decades for people to get over conspicuous consumption um, and doing this. And I think post-COVID, the, the fate of luxury brands or just sort of uh, fast fashion cycles is really going to be questioned. So what you started to see in these other emerging markets was the, the asset building was really quick and, and, and was predictable, but the cycle was much quicker of saying, we don't really want that. So I'll give an example of, of, of something like China. Um, everybody was riding bicycles. Um, and then within the, when the economic reforms happened, everybody bought cars. And then there was just huge pollution. Now everybody has gone back to ride sharing bicycle models, which is different. So people always say to me, um, you know, so, so the, the trends, the, I said it goes from one extreme to the other. It always falls back into the middle, but the middle is not the same where it falls back in. So I hope that's answered that, that question um, on that. 
Um, next question, Anna, can I do that with, with uh, Augusta, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on cybercrime and, and crime in general? Um, this one, we still have yet to actually see what's, what's going to happen. Um, because yes, uh, so cybercrime and attacking people um, you know, on, on platforms like Zoom, um, I've got a lot of um, clients who, who the, it's company policy not to use Zoom. Um, as a presenter, my heart really sinks when they say um, we have to use something like Microsoft Teams. Sorry for people who are using Microsoft Teams, but it is really not a user-friendly platform to, to do so. But we are seeing the, the, the start of that. One of the interesting things for your question is about cybercrime and privacy in general, is that that was another thing that was coming up onto the people's radar and a pushback on privacy. My huge worry with that is we're seeing this spike in contact tracing apps around the world. Um, and of course, uh, you know, a country like China, where it's very authoritarian, we've seen where the civil, civil liberties disappear uh, with that, and it's linked to social, um, social credit scores, all of those kind of things they're rolling out in the UK. So in terms, it's not exactly cybercrime, but crime in general, but we are, I've been saying for a long time that the next rich mine of, of data that people want is not going to come from retail, but it is your health records. And now your health records is going to be the next gold mine in terms of what companies want from you. And we are going to, very much like security, going through security at airports, going to give up, or it'll be a question, do you want to give up all of those uh, personal health data over to companies in order for them to, to monitor you and do that? Great. Um, okay, uh, Cindy. <laughs> oh gosh, this one's a good one. Uh, about speak up culture, um, not implemented in most companies. Uh, no, um, Cindy. This is why I've actually got this um, into into doing into pushing uh, through with this. Um, what is interesting, the only way I can answer it because I completely agree with you, and I, I don't have a, a counter argument to it, except to say. Um, I, I launched my own innovation tour um, in February. We we're going to roll it out around the country, but COVID has put a stop to that, but uh, we'll have more of them. But we had a lot of corporate companies coming onto that. And what we did, because I believed that the innovation tours that I went on internationally were fantastic, but they weren't speaking to African or South African solution-based innovation, which is what we are really, really good at on this continent. Um, and one of the, 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 the senior executives from an asset management company said to me afterwards, he said what he realized, um, but this was only when the scales fell off his eyes, was he said what he realized is when executives take a decision, all the executives get into a room and discuss that. He says we do not, and that's what he realized, he says we do not even consult any of our younger workforce. Um, and even if it's down to doing the menial tasks that entry-level workers have to do, the grunt work, as he called it, we don't even ask them, is there a better way to do the grunt work? And that was a big revelation for him. But I'm sorry, I agree with you. It is not in that company culture, and it has to change very, very quickly. Um, Brett, uh, about in decline. Unfortunately, yes. Um, I think through this time, it depends who is going to be able to survive. And those very, very short little um, interim business models, if that is going to be able to take your restaurants and things through uh, to it. <clears throat> There's going to be a lot of um, collateral damage that happens there. And that was why I, I brought that up. My, my biggest fear is that we're going to have a very bland landscape where it's just big multinationals and big franchises and we lose out the independent retailers. So, so everybody listening, please, please, please support your, your small businesses. Just push all of your, your business to them. They really, really need it. Um, okay, um, anonymous um, <clears throat> about tax uh, about tax issues. Um, gosh, that's a that's a very interesting one. I'm I'm not sure I've got an answer uh, for you. Um, I'll put it to if you can just email us at Flux Trends. Um, Bronwyn Williams is our is our finance specialist at Flux. Maybe she can answer that. So so just email us onto the website at, at fluxtrends.com and we'll see if we can do that. Um, Kavisha, um, innovation capability uh, developing in South Africa, um, lack of interest or political factors. That's a very interesting one. So um, one of the, uh, the people that used to write for me at Flux, he had a, a brilliant uh, career ahead of him as an investment banker. And he was poached by one of the Morgan Stanleys or one of those in New York. He went there for two months. He came back here. 
Um, and in true kind of millennial, he has a millennial form, he suddenly got really dizzy from looking at his screen and, and the stock markets all day, landed up in hospital, and he just said, enough, this is not the future I want. So at the ripe old age of 22 or 23, he bailed out of what would have been this career that I'm sure the parents would have been saying, but this is what your future really, really is supposed to be. And he just said no. And he started something called House Me. You'll, you might know what it is. But in his innovation process, he went to, to look at app developers in India. He went to Silicon Valley. And the interesting thing he said was that when he came back to South Africa, what he realized was we don't have the shortage of ideas, hence my innovation tour of, of different cities and, and African cities in, 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 uh, in South Africa and in Africa. But he says we, we have or the corporate or the business appetite to support that, those ideas. In Silicon Valley, he says once you have an idea, you announce it to, to the rest of the world, everybody comes sniffing. They're saying, what have you got? it might just be the next best thing. There's a bigger appetite for risk, and even if it's not the biggest thing, I want in on this just in case I might miss out. In South Africa, what we have is everybody sits back and waits for somebody to help them out, or that poor entrepreneur to try and struggle and get things up by the bootstraps, and once it's successful, then we fight over it. So it's a very, very big um, difference in terms of appetite for risk, and creating that enabling environment. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to the next one for Alex. Uh, Africa's consumer mining uh, uh, personal, can the youth fit in or do they need to develop new directions? Um, Alex, the, the short and kind of depressing answer is I don't think if you look at digital natives and where the interests are, it is digital. Um, so you are starting to see already in certain sectors, specifically agricultural farming, that there's a drop off of younger people entering or wanting to be a farmer or wanting to do those kind of things. Everybody wants to do something a lot more digital, but therein lies probably the opportunity for maybe an older workforce. If you want to do that complete pivot or what we're calling not pivots, pirouettes totally out of uh, from one sector into a completely different one, um, that is it. And just a quick one on that, because I know we run, run out of time, but I just want to answer that and, and get to Tracy's uh, question as well, is what we have to, to, to really understand about when we talk about fourth industrial revolution or, or displacement of jobs to algorithms or to automation is that the parallel talk is about a displacement economy. So generally, in most sectors, you see those workers displaced into much more of a service-oriented um, uh, uh, sector that, that feeds back into the original um, business or the operation. The problem is, and especially with that uh, question on mining, is that the, the, the skills needed to be displaced um, aren't there. So what do we do, where, especially when you mention mining, it is much more sensible to send a robot two kilometers underground rather than human beings but what do those miners do if they don't have the technical skills to do that? So just a quick one before I come to Tracy, uh, it's, it's a rather audacious one that I said to businesses is that their new uh, CSI policy should not only be outward looking because in South Africa with the largest GDP coefficient, we have to look outside of organizations to, to prop up society, but also the new CSI for me is actually inward looking. So you have to keep up skilling your workforce all the time, which is a win-win situation. You not only get the best skills, but if and when that person is displaced by an algorithm, by automation, you give that person a fighting chance to actually be displaced. And I think I lay the, the, the responsibility squarely at the feet of, of those corporate companies to ensure that there is that displacement and it's a bit more fluid and seamless to do that. All right, last one, um, Tracy. Uh, will become more environmentally conscious. Um, youngest content leading population. Um, is that a, I'm not sure if that's a question or is, a, is that a statement? Um, but I will just say, um, <clears throat> okay, so you're saying that the population is the I, I might sound a little bit like a beauty queen now, but I put my trust in Gen Z. <laughs> the kids are our future and um, uh, um, Hazel was, uh, attended our, our webinar on that last week and uh, she can tell you 
um, the mindset of that. I, I, I stand where you're saying about population explosion and, and environmentally conscious, but after studying or tracking Gen Z for the past five years, I'm quite confident to say that those climate change and the, 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 the sustainability issues will lead in parallel with this population explosion. Um, to end off, um, we had two Gen Zs on our panel, uh, the one that Hazel attended, and uh, there were some big companies, and you could see them ask really kind of fundamental bottom line things, which you could see the Gen Zs were a bit distasteful about that, but sort of saying, how do I sell you a healthcare policy, or or what what makes what influences you to buy my product? So it was just product, 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 and these both Gen, the Gen Zs literally spat back and said. Um, just remember, we're not just going to blindly buy your product. We are going to ask the questions. Is it sustainable? Is it child labor? Is it this? What's the supply chain like? And all of those kind of things. And my last thing, just to end off, Anna, just I know I'm completely over time, but it was the CEO, <clears throat> and I'll tell you the company, it was the Coca-Cola bottling company. I've been doing some work with him last year. And he said an amazing thing about Africa, Gen Z, and perceptions about Africa and innovation. He said, for the company, they assume that every single African country that they are in, they assume that that is a first world country. And he says that because of a younger generation and connectivity. So connectivity is key. If we have connectivity, what a teenager sees in Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire um, and is on the other side of the planet, that teenager will ask, why is that not in my, my country? And the CEO said, and the danger is some entrepreneur within that country is going to hook onto solution-based innovation and then create something that takes away our market share. So we do not underestimate the African continent or Gen Z. And I hope I've answered that question. Absolutely. Thank you, Dion, so much for these inspiring responses. And it's such a pity that we're nearly running out of time. We could stay here for so much longer. Um, thank you to all the participants for all the questions. And um, just by way of closing, um, you will be concerned that the aim of these GSBNL webinar series um, is to empower our students, our alumni, our business partners, and of course all our stakeholders with information that will enable us to navigate the unprecedented times and challenges that COVID-19 pandemic has obviously brought upon us. We have been requested by some of our participants to look into the area of project management and how service delivery could be compromised due to escalating costs of COVID-19. And what can be done by project managers to mitigate the negative effects of the pandemic on local economic development. So um, more information will be sent out in the next two weeks before our next webinar. So um, perhaps we obviously will take uh, contemplate these and many more other topics. So I encourage you to send us suggestions on topics and, and issues that you would like us to cover in the near future. And we will ensure that we will bring you the experts as we've done today to shed light on complex issues we are faced with in the post-COVID-19 era. Remember that your suggestions can be sent directly to Hazel Langer, our public relations manager, via email, and that we'll send through also still now via chat. And um, you'll also be pleased to know that the recording of this webinar will be made available on the GSBNL website later on today. So once again, I thank you, Dion, very much for this most insightful presentation and all the thoughts you've shared with us. And you leave us with a note, um, a new mindset, a learning mindset and a learning approach to life because that's what COVID-19 has just reminded us of. Um, thank you, Dion. And thank Great. you to thank everybody you. that is. Uh, and Peter, thanks for managing um backstage because with these virtual things there is a whole backstage as well uh, people don't realize the the, the the work that also goes into those things um and just i hope i, I see there's other questions i know we've run out of time but uh, so we can't answer them but uh, just a closing statement from me is when people ask me what do you do i just say to them um i make you think differently and i hope i've uh, been able to achieve that today so thank you so much for having me it's been a great honor um, and a great pleasure thank you very very much and thank you to hazel langer and the team 
for having organized and made these webinars possible. Thank you to everyone and stay well. Thank you. Bye.